Welcome and thank you for joining this webinar. I'm Colin Angel, the Policy Director at the United Kingdom Home Care Association. I'm going to start with a presentation which will last for just under half an hour. We're going to look at why getting the prices paid for home care right is important for market stability, how the cost of home care can be calculated, including the newly arising cost pressures from April 2019. We'll also look at factors, including care workers' travel time, which affect the cost of care. There will be a live question and answer session at the end of the webinar. Delegates can follow the on-screen instructions to ask questions, and I'll try to answer as many as I can at the end of the presentation. During the presentation, I'm going to refer to councils and local authorities, but the same principles will apply to the National Health Service and the Health and Social Care Trusts in Northern Ireland. Let's get started with the presentation. There are a number of reasons why getting the price for home care services right is important for councils. Local authorities in Great Britain and the Health and Social Care Trusts in Northern Ireland have had budget cuts while also experiencing increased demand for services from their local population. This is the point where social care is now usually a council's largest budget spend. Local authorities in England have been given new market shaping responsibilities as a result of the Care Act 2014. And at the same time, providers have been increasingly willing to hand back contracts or individual packages of care which are no longer financially viable for them to deliver. Recently, a number of tenders have not attracted sufficient bids to make an award or have been subject to challenge from providers. And finally, there are political aspirations from a number of authorities to subcontract with providers who will pay the voluntary UK, Scottish or London living wage and offer guaranteed hours contracts. There are particular financial implications for that commitment, which we'll look at later on during the presentation. I'm going to illustrate the implications of inadequate prices paid for home care by using some data from the Association of Directors of Adult Social Services. The ADAS Budget Survey in 2017 and 2018 reported on the number of people who'd been affected by market failures during a six-month period in each year. Let's start with what happened in the residential sector where you can see that slightly more people were affected by financial failures in 2018 than the previous year. But if we compare that to the home care sector, in 2017 we saw considerably more people affected. And in 2018, although we see fewer financial failures as a result of providers ceasing trading, we see more packages of care handed back by providers who were saying that they could not deliver the quality required for the price that authorities were willing to pay. There is of course an imperative for home care providers to ensure that the prices they receive for care adequately covers the cost of delivering the service. Let's look at some of the supply and demand pressures. Inadequate fees paid for care affects the terms and conditions of the workforce, which has a knock-on effect to recruitment and retention. We see that through low wages, employers' ability to reimburse travel costs, and the general experience of being a care worker when there are insufficient staff available to meet demand. Home care providers are in competition with other local employers and indeed that's something which may be exacerbated by the UK's departure from the European Union. And people who fund their own care are often willing to pay significantly higher rates than local authorities. There are also risks for providers associated from these cost pressures, including financial failure, non-compliance with the national minimum wage regulations, and increasing costs occurring this year, for example, an increased contribution to workplace pensions and the impact of the apprenticeship levy. We can get a national and regional picture of the prices that councils pay for state-funded home care 
From a Freedom of Information inquiry which UKHCA undertook in April 2018, we asked every council in Great Britain and the Health and Social Care Trusts in Northern Ireland to tell us the average price that they paid for an hour of home care and we compared that to UKHCA's minimum price for home care for the same period. We can see that there's distinct variation between what councils are paying with particularly low prices in the northwest and northeast of England and Northern Ireland. The full detail of all Council's responses to that inquiry are provided in the main report and I've put a link to that at the end of the webinar. The way that Councils across the UK purchase home care on behalf of their local citizens has a direct impact on the stability of local care markets. In England, the Care Act 2014 placed market shaping responsibilities on councils and the Care and Support Statutory Guidance describes the principles for how this should be undertaken. Councils should have contract terms, conditions and fee levels which provide the delivery of the agreed care packages at the agreed quality of care. This should allow the provider to meet at least the national minimum wage to provide effective training and development of staff, to allow retention of staff, to encourage innovation and improvement, and to provide a rate of return so that a sufficient pool of providers remain sustainable. Now, that's specific guidance for England, but I hope you'll agree that the principles hold true across the UK. Since 2012, UKHCA has produced a minimum price for home care. Our methodology has been verified by experienced finance directors from different size organisations. We explain the assumptions we use to create the figures in this presentation and our assumptions are verified against the best available data. Our minimum price for home care also works with our online costing model and I've provided links to both of these at the end of the webinar. We're committed to keeping UKHA's minimum price for home care up to date by using the best available data and keeping track of changes in providers' cost pressures. The significant updates from April 2019 include an increase in the statutory national living wage for workers aged 25 years and above, which goes up by 38 pence an hour. The national minimum wage goes up by 32 pence an hour. The voluntary Scottish and UK living wage rises by 25 pence an hour. And the London living wage is 35 pence an hour more. In addition, employers' minimum contributions to their employees' workplace pensions increase from 2 to 3% of gross pay. And thanks to some work that we've done with the Access Group looking at travel time data, our assumption has increased from 11.4 to 11.7 minutes of travel per hour of care, while our assumption for care workers' mileage has decreased from 4 to 3.89 miles per hour of care. Let's have a look at how we build up the minimum price for home care. I'm going to use the principles in UKHCA's costing model to show you how we reach a figure of £18.93 as the minimum hourly price from April 2019. We're going to start by paying the care worker for delivering care in somebody's home. We refer to that as the contact time and care workers must receive at least the statutory national living wage if they're aged 25 years and above, or the national minimum wage. If we look at the average age profile of the workforce, the cost to employers is going to be at least £8.15 pence per hour. But of course, employers also have to pay for the applicable travel time, generally the time spent travelling between one service user's home and another. That will add on average £1.59 to the cost of an hour of care. So care workers' gross pay will be £9.74 per hour. Now, employers have additional contributions to make. They have to pay 
uh, their contribution to the national insurance and the care workers' pensions. That will add one pound and seven pence to an hour of care. And there are other wage related on costs, including holiday pay, training time, sickness and notice pay. And those are going to add a further one pound fifty seven to the cost of care. And employers will be reimbursing care workers mileage. We think that's one pound thirty six on top of the costs already accrued. So the cost just for the care worker have become £13.74. But of course the business itself has to operate and there are costs of staffing the office, recruiting and training new care workers, paying for the premises and utilities, consumables that are used delivering care and other overheads. And that adds another £4.64 for running the business. And then organisations must make a profit or a surplus and that will add another 55 pence to an hour of care. So if we add all of those up, we reach a minimum price based on flat rate national minimum wage or national living wage of £18.93 per hour. There's an important distinction between a minimum price for home care and a fair price. Our figure of £18.93 per hour can achieve compliance with the law. However, this rate does not include incentivising care workers to undertake unsocial hours working or the need to pay workers above the statutory minimum wage in order for employers to remain competitive in the local labour market. There are some important issues which will help with the understanding of costing an hour of home care. The first is that councils almost entirely will only ever pay for contact time, the time the care worker spends in the service user's home. But providers must cover care workers' entire working time, including applicable travel time. Now that doesn't mean that the employer must make a separate payment for the care worker's travel, but in order to comply with the national minimum wage regulations, when a care worker's total pay is divided by their total working hours, the worker must receive at least the applicable rate of the national minimum wage. Care providers must also factor the cost of non-working time into the hourly price. That includes earning the money that will pay for care workers' holiday pay, paying care workers to undertake training or supervision. Care workers' mileage also needs to be reimbursed, as failure to do so can lead to non-compliance with the national minimum wage regulations. Business costs must include paying staff who are needed to deliver services safely. And of course, profit isn't a dirty word. Profit is the incentive for people to invest their money in a care service, rather than investing it elsewhere. I'm going to look now at the minimum price increase that home care providers will require from April 2019 just to remain in a similar financial position than they were the year before. Now there'll be a temptation from some authorities to say that if the national living wage increases by 38 pence that's what their care providers should get. However the cost of an hour of home care is not that straightforward and indeed this year employers face an additional 1% of gross pay in terms of their extra contributions to the workers' workplace pension. Let's have a look how it works in practice. If we take the increases in the national minimum wage and the national living wage, employers face an additional cost of 37 pence on average for the contact time, but we'll need to add an additional 11 pence to cover care workers' travel time. Employers will also be contributing to national insurance and that extra pension contribution. That's going to add 14 pence an hour. And then extra on costs such as holiday pay, etc. will add a further 4 pence an hour. So if you take travel time, national insurance, pensions and other wage related on costs, there's an additional 29 pence of costs. And of course, if you're increasing the pay of frontline home care workers, office-based staff will expect a pay increase too. That's going to add 8 pence an hour to the cost of care. 
And then there are additional inflationary pressures on the costs of running the business. Um, that will add another 18 pence. So office staff running the business and the provider's profit or surplus will add 26 pence an hour. So if we add all those together, we're coming up at a minimum increase required of 92 pence an hour rather than 38 pence. Now, some councils will argue that the inflation rate is running at about 2.2%. That's the most recent consumer price index. And UKHCA's minimum price has gone up by 5.11%. Well, that's absolutely true. But that illustrates how inflationary costs in the home care sector are largely driven by increases in the statutory minimum wage. And those increases are going up much higher than the consumer price index. There are a number of requirements to ensure that the prices paid for home care are sustainable. Prices must cover workforce costs, including care workers' travel time, to ensure compliance with the national minimum wage regulations. Rates paid must also enable employers to recognise the wage expectations of the local labour market to ensure that there's a sufficient workforce to meet demand. Prices must also cover providers' costs of regulation, supervision, organisation and training to meet the necessary quality and safety requirements. And finally, businesses must receive a sufficient profit or surplus to maintain market stability, enable providers to innovate and reinvest in their services. In addition to producing a minimum price for home care, which enables employers to meet the statutory national minimum wage and national living wage, UKHCA also produces equivalent rates for the higher UK and Scottish living wages and the London living wage. Let's look at how those prices are built up. We start with the contact time for the care worker at the applicable wage rate, add their travel time, include wage on costs, reimbursement of the care worker's mileage, the costs of running the business, which also include the wages of office-based staff, and then the provider's profit or surplus. The comparison between £18.93 per hour for the statutory minimum wage then becomes £20.75 for the UK and Scottish living wages or £23.97 per hour for the London living wage. I'm going to take you through a highly simplified explanation of how compliance with the national minimum wage regulations is assessed. We'll start by taking a care worker's total pay before enhancements divide that by the total working time and make sure that the hourly rate is at or above the prevailing rate of the national minimum wage or in the case of workers aged 25 years and above the national living wage of £8.21 an hour. We'll have a look in a bit more detail now. The calculation is conducted as an average over a pay reference period which is up to one month. The total pay used is the basic rate of pay and excludes enhancements, for example, for unsocial hours working or short visits. Neither of those would count towards compliance with the national minimum wage. The total working time is a combination of the total contact time, that's the time spent providing care in the service user's home, and it also includes the care worker's travel time between visits and training approved by the employer. It does, however, exclude journeys to and from the worker's home and other non-working time. Now, you'll see from this calculation why it's really important to make sure that we have a correct understanding of what both the time spent delivering care and travel and training time is in order to comply with the law. I'm going to show you how the length of a home care visit affects the costs of care workers' wages. I'm going to use a really simple example 
of a care worker who travels from home to do the first visit of the day which lasts 30 minutes. There's then a 10 minute journey to the next person's home where care is also 30 minutes long. There's another 10 minute drive for the third visit of the day also lasting 30 minutes before the care worker travels back home. In this example the council will pay the provider for 90 minutes of care but the provider is going to also have to pay the worker for another 20 minutes of travel. That's the journey time between the three visits. So here travel time has added 18% to the care worker's pay. Now let's keep the same roster for this worker but make the visits shorter. The travel time is going to be 10 minutes between each house. The service users didn't move any closer together just because the visits were shorter. But here we'll do three 15 minute visits. Now the council is only going to pay for 45 minutes of care but the employer is still going to have to cover those 20 minutes of travel. So here the travel time has added 31% to the cost of care workers pay. You'll see from this example how critical it is to make sure that the price has paid for contact time, the time spent in the service user's home, is going to cover the full costs of care including the care worker's travel. A number of councils, including those who have committed to Unison's Ethical Care Charter, are asking care providers to offer guaranteed hours contracts to their workforce. In order to do this, providers must be able to cover the costs of all of care workers' working time, that's the time spent delivering care, the travel time, and any downtime where the care worker is contracted to be at work but is not out delivering services on behalf of the provider. So councils must pay enough to cover the wages of the worker for the entire span of duty for which they're contracted. In our view, paying solely for the care worker's contact time is incompatible with asking providers to offer guaranteed hours contracts. There are a number of issues which also affect the attractiveness or commercial viability of home care contracts. Here are just a few of them. Unrealistic maximum prices in the invitation to tender act as a signal to providers that they shouldn't submit a bid at a rate which is going to be commercially viable for them. Often contract terms are stacked largely or mainly in the favour of the council leading to grossly inequitable contractual relationships. Often contracts have no guarantee of a price increase during the entire life of the contract. Some have cost saving strategies which impact on the workforce such as permanent billing. While others have vague or unquantifiable liabilities such as untested payment by results mechanisms. All of these issues, when combined with an inadequate price for home care, create a real possibility that a contract will not be financially sustainable for the provider. In addition to producing UKHCA's minimum price for home care, we also worked with the Department of Health and Social Care, local government representatives and the Care Provider Alliance to produce a document published by the Chartered Institute of Public Finance and Accountancy called Working with Care Providers to Understand Costs. This document explains the principles of costing both home care and residential services and encourages commissioners to work with providers to determine and agree actual costs at a local level. I've put a link to this document at the end of the webinar. The SIP for Guidance that I've just mentioned provides a model for engagement between councils and providers and some advice on undertaking costing exercises. I produced a brief summary here. Councils should engage with providers to understand their costs. They should start early to allow sufficient time to agree changes, particularly before starting procurement exercises. They should share relevant information on their numbers and costs, comparing like with like data and reflecting actual costs incurred during their modelling. 
Councils and providers should consider options which will minimise transaction costs and enable timely payments to be made. Terms should incentivise increased capacity and allow for innovation. And finally, SIPFA recommend that councils and providers publish their findings to maintain an evidence trail. I've included a list of links to useful documents and resources on this slide here. And you can watch this entire webinar, download the handouts and share with your colleagues by visiting www.ukhca.co.uk forward slash price webinar.